The topic is enabling your data to speak the language of the business. I want to explore what that means and how to go about achieving it. And the way I want to start off uh, talking about the subject, um, which is concept models, is I'm going to show you how concept models are very different today from data models. I'm also going to explain why concept models are indispensable for the kind of work all of you need to be doing. And I'll get to that in good time. But first, I want to start off by examining a data modeling puzzle. I think you'll find it interesting. It's a bit long, but it's well worth the trouble. So stick with me on this as we work through it. Now, your driver's license has a unique identifier. A given driver's license, of course, should be held by at most only one person, and only at most a single person should hold a given driver's license. Now, does that make the person and the driver's license the same thing? Well, of course not. A driver's license isn't a person. That's a false equivalence. A driver's license is not flesh and blood, and it doesn't go driving around by itself. It's an authorization that permits a flesh and blood person to drive illegally. Uh, that's how we should think about it. That's what it is. But data designs and data designers often seek to take advantage of one-to-one -one identifiers and collapse things as if they were the same. And that's what's been done in this consolidated driver table. As you can see, uh, it has driver's license number on the left as its key, and it mixes data about two distinct things, driver's license data, which is shaded in gold, and driver data, which is shaded in pink. Now, conceptually, that's just wrong. What world does that represent? But that's only a small part of the story. And this is no mere academic curiosity. Big dangers will lurk in the data, particularly for data quality. And that's what I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about all the bad effects that can happen. Now, in order to explore this subject together, let's instantiate the table to have some data to play with. Now, in the first row of the table, the driver's table, uh, you can see Mr. Sample, um, uh, our guy, and his data is in the first row. And we do have a few other rows with various classes of driver's license and so on, uh, just to make this uh, a bit more uh, interesting. Now, mixing driver data with driver license data produces a big challenge for this data design, specifically how to handle unlicensed drivers. Now, unfortunately, people without driver's license do drive and they do get into accidents. And although they don't have driver's license numbers, they will find their way into your data. They become what I call phantoms. Now, the question, of course, is how will you handle phantoms in your data designs? Let's take uh, Miss Kathy Wong here. She drove without a driver's license, and unfortunately for her, she got caught. Now, how will you handle Ms. Wong in the false equivalence data design? Well, here's how we might include data from Ms. Wong in the driver's table. We got her in, but let's look very closely at what we've done in the process. First, we've created a driver's license number that isn't a driver's license number because she doesn't drive. That's data pollution. Second, we've created a class of driver's license that isn't a class of driver's license, which we've called none, but that's not a class of driver's license. Uh, and there you have even more data pollution. Thirdly, up until now, uh, resident city 
was probably mandatory for all of our drivers with driver's license. Um, and we could probably count on knowing their city of residence with some degree of confidence. But for Miss Wong, we may not even know what state she's from. So we have a problem, more problems with data quality. And this gets even worse. Now, if you look at some dates in the two date columns, you'll see some dates that aren't actually dates. So all your rules and standards about valid dates just flew out the window. Now think about how this data pollution might affect your analytics. Suppose you're doing long-term research planning and you need to ask a question like, for example, how many driver's license will explore, will, will expire after 2020? Well, you're not going to easily get the right answer. You're going to have to do some additional work to parse out the data that's relevant to the, to the query. Now, do remember, for the sake of clarity, I've kept this example as simple as possible. But do imagine all the complexity we're adding to maintaining and using this data correctly. You really have to sit and ask yourself, even for this simple example, is all the extra work and all the workarounds really worth the trouble? And let me speak very plainly about this. It's design choices like these that crap up your data. People are going to make mistakes no matter what. Data quality is going to suffer. Why, data, why design data so as to make it more likely people will make mistakes? Now let's remember why all this trouble started. The data design equated two concepts that weren't the same. As a consequence, we find it difficult to handle phantoms like our Ms. Wong. In doing what we had to do under this data design, we polluted our data badly. The worst part is we actually brought all this trouble onto ourselves. Now, how many of you have phantoms like that in your data designs? Uh, my guess is just about everybody uh, in attendance. So I think we need to stand back in the time that we have available today and look at closely at the underlying concepts in the matter. In other words, I think we need a concept model. So how do we do that? How do we create a concept model? Well, here's a, click, a, a quick preview. We look closely at the nouns and the verbs that we use to communicate about the problem and base our model directly on them. Now here's a simple, very simple, very limited starter concept model diagram to illustrate. And you can see their nouns as you might expect in the boxes, but there are also some verb phrases such as driver holds driver's license, driver's license is held by driver. Now, one thing there aren't yet is any definitions, and that's actually the key part, but we'll get to that momentarily. So I'm sure you're going to want to ask, and maybe we'll have an opportunity to discuss after my presentation more, what's the difference between a concept model and a data model? And I'm going to develop a whole series of differences during this presentation, but here's a big one and it's the first that I've gotten to. A concept model pays no attention whatsoever to keys and cardinalities. Why? Because that's pure IT speak. That's not business speak. Business people don't talk in terms of keys and cardinalities. So starting off by talking about keys and cardinalities puts the cart way before the, heart, the horse. First, understand the world and otherwise conceptualize the world properly, then think about how it can be represented in data. Now, actually, how a concept model can be represented in data is not necessarily all that hard. To illustrate, let's follow our example through to a better data design. 
Uh, based on the concept model, this data design features separate tables for drivers versus drivers licenses, even though at most the instances are one to one. Now, what we've done is we've introduced a new meaningless identifier for drivers, which is not tied in any way to driver's license number. And of course, there's a foreign key <clears throat> in the driver table <clears throat> based on driver's license number in order to link the tables. Perfectly reasonable way to design the underlying data. Now there's the data for our guy, Mr. Sample, sitting in the driver's table in the first row there. And it's linked uh, be, via the foreign key, the driver's license number, uh, in the driver's license table. Uh, it's there in the first row of that table. There's Mr. Sample's driver's license uh, data. So neat and clean, no problem, pretty straightforward. Now, some observations about this data design. First, our unlicensed driver, Ms. Wong, appears only in the driver's table. And that's correct, because she has no driver's license. Second, now there's no polluted data sitting in the three fields of the driver's license table. Uh, class of driver's license, date of issue, expiration date, those uh, are clean. They follow all the data quality rules. Um, so we're in good shape there. Third, you're more likely to get correct results with a lot easier query formulation for your analytics, uh, like the query, how many driver's license will expire after 2020. So that's all good news. Um, but for better data quality, here's another step we've taken. You can't necessarily trust what's listed on a driver's license as representing the most recent known address for a person. Our Mr. Sample here, for example, used to live in Phoenix, as you can see, but currently lives in Scottsdale. He moved. So to say that differently, you can't necessarily change what was physically listed on the actual driver's license just because a person has a new address. So now, as shown, we have two differently named fields in the respective tables. We have current resident city in the driver's table versus resident city listed, still physically listed on the existing driver's license uh, in the driver's license table. And that's correct. That's accurate with respect to the real world, better data quality. Now we've done some other things to help us out as well with respect to data quality. We've introduced a new field called deceased in the driver's table. Now, unfortunately, we live in the real world. People do die, but when they die, it's not the driver's license that dies. It's the person that dies. Putting a deceased field in the driver's license table that would just be too weird. Think about it, a deceased driver's license. Now there's a real phantom for you. The, this problem with phantoms happens all the time. For example, just to give you other uh, cases of it, um, scheduled doctor's appointment is not the same as the actual visit to the doctor's office. Think about all the no-shows and the walk-ins that may happen for scheduled doctor's appointments. So you're gonna have the very same problem with phantoms. And a flight reservation. Now, when I used to travel a couple of years ago, uh, hope to restart this year, as I'm, I, I think many of you will or have already, a flight reservation is not the same as the actual flights. Oh, I found that out many times for uh, reasons of cancellations and weather delays and all sorts of other reasons. A hotel reservation is not the same as your actual hotel stay. False equivalences. We don't want to go there. Conceptually, they're different things. Don't combine them and pollute your data. Now, the general topic that these examples represent is called classification. 
And classification, uh, sort of a fancy word that really just boils down to putting things into the right conceptual buckets. You can think of uh, concepts ready, uh, um, representing conceptual buckets. And what do you need for that? Well, you need compelling business definitions, not just data definitions, you need business definitions. And for the sake of clarity, let me emphasize, those are not the same thing. If you can't tell me clearly what something is, directly and unambiguously, you have little hope of ever getting the data designs right. And I'll stand by that statement 100%. So here are some examples of good working definitions and definitional criteria. Uh, for our concept of driver, uh, we could define that as a person in actual physical control of a vehicle. Just the essence of the concept, no add-ons, no explanations, no purposes, uh, and even no rules. Definition of driver's license and authorization to operate a vehicle. And we might have a definitional rule about that. A driver's license is always held by exactly one person. Now, you can treat that as cardinality, but really it's a rule. Good definitions are business-oriented, relatively short, and highly succinct. And good definitions also give you direct clues for proper classification of things. Let's look at this closely. In the case of driver and driver's license, for example, a person is not an authorization. Those are completely different concepts. So there's a very telling clue there, right in that first word, that we're talking about different things, and therefore no mashups in designing uh, the data. Now, just as an aside here, you'll find surprisingly that about 50% of the work in creating great business definitions is in selecting that very first word in the definitions. We call it the kickoff word, and it really puts a stake in the, in a, in the ground in terms of what the concept is about. I'll give you some more examples and how that kickoff word is used in just a few minutes. But first, a second major difference between concept models and data models. Business definitions reign supreme in concept models. They are first and foremost. Diagrams do not make up a concept model. I think in data modeling, we've always had it backwards. The, the, uh, mo the model needed is not the model needed for business communication and disambiguation. It's not about drawing boxes and arrows. It's really about creating great business definitions. The diagrams just serve to give you visual illustrations of what the definitions should essentially already be saying. Well, let's explore definitions a bit more because, as you can hear, it's really a very important topic. What does a good business definition do for you? Well, a good definition gives you exhaustive criteria for determining when an instance out in the real world or the uh, domain of discourse does or does not belong to a given conceptual bucket. Now, why is that important? Because the source of much ambiguity in many business area errors and much miscommunication is what I like to call boundary cases. And those are examples or instances or cases that it's hard to decide whether they fall within the conceptual bucket or not based on the definitional criteria. Now here's an example to illustrate using uh, a definition from Merriam-Webster Unabridged Dictionary. Uh, this is for the purposes of insurance. They might try to extract the definition from uh, Merriam-Webster Unabridged Dictionary for vehicle, which is a means of carrying or transporting something, a conveyance, a carrier of goods or passengers. But as you can see, as we start looking carefully at examples here, and I've got, what, seven different examples, the weakness of the definitions, for the purpose of insurance anyway, becomes quite visible. Will they insure trains? 
Well, that's a conveyance or a carrier of goods or passengers transporting something. Uh, will they transport, will, will they uh, insure horse and buggy? Again, same difference. Uh, how about a jet ski, a boat? You know, so these boundary cases pretty much point out clearly that for the purpose and intent of communication within the business about insurance things, that definition just doesn't make the grade. So what do we do? Well, we need to revise the definition and find something that address, uh, addresses the boundary cases better. So let's look at this alternative for vehicle. We might describe it as a motorized means of carrying or transporting something on land, not water, but on land, without the need for rails, like railroad tracks. So this revised definition now is sufficient to properly evaluate most of these boundary cases. Uh, just a couple of questionable cases still stand out. Uh, motorcycles. They don't operate on rails, they operate on land, they are motorized, so maybe they're in the conceptual bucket or maybe not, still perhaps need a little bit more discussion. And tractors, I mean, you could run a tractor on the road, but it's motorized, uh, no need for rails, so same difference here. But gradually, we're sort of converging on a better definition that does uh, and is very clear about indicating what things should in the real world or universe of discourse be classified as vehicles. So here's one important insight about creating definitions that I'll make just in passing. The secret, one secret, is to look at lots and lots of examples. Examples, examples, and more examples. And actually, you know, this shouldn't surprise you because classification, which is really what we're talking about in this first part of concept model discussion, uh, is really all about knowing when to put examples or instances into which conceptual buckets at what times. Now, I've heard some software professionals, and sorry if I go off on a little rant here, but I think in the presentation, I'm allowed uh, to get on the soapbox at least once. I've heard some software professionals and some yeah, in, the, some in the, the software ontology community saying not to do definitions because they will just slow you down. They will bog you down. You'll never get past them. And users, uh, business people lose interest and so on. Well, I'm sorry. That is just absolute nonsense. Nonsense. Without definitions, how can you ever be sure about classifying stuff correctly? Without definitions, how can you ever be sure that you're actually communicating about things correctly and precisely? Knowledge, business knowledge, is very complex. I think we don't fully realize how complex business knowledge is, even for simple businesses. And so this is no trivial matter. It's a step you, you just cannot get past. It's very important to get uh, business definitions in plain business English. And so they can be verified with business people and sometimes even arise from business people. So. Creating robust, business-friendly business definitions is frankly a scarce skill, and it's not innate. It doesn't come with your technical training. It's not in your IT programs. You know, as for any professional discipline, there are special techniques and lots and lots of tips and tricks uh, for creating great business definitions. It's really something you have to focus on. You got to learn. Um, it doesn't come naturally, it comes with a lot of practice. So a question for you um, sitting in the audience is, well, how familiar are you? Uh, are you as familiar as you need to be with um, business friendly best practices for creating best uh, for creating business definitions? So what I've done uh, is accumulate a lot of the do's and don'ts, uh, guidelines for creating business definitions and um, included those in my new book, which is oh, about a year older or so, 
um, called Business Knowledge Blueprints. Um, and there's four complete chapters def, uh, devoted to creating uh, definitions with lots of do's and don'ts and, and uh, uh, examples to illustrate. So anyway, let's come back now full circle to concept models because this is a presentation about concept models and I wanted to spend a good deal of time on this first topic of classification and business definitions because frankly it is the most important and diagrams are just for illustration purposes um, uh, and, and they help move things along but they're not fundamental to the work. So concept models they they actually feature three major notions or ideas and they are classification which as i've said is putting things in the right conceptual buckets which you do with business definitions as the basis and then categorization and that's a very important technique if you're familiar at all with subtyping uh, in data modeling you're sort of sort of in the right conceptual feel, but that's a little difficult for business people and not necessarily right on target. Now, surprisingly, what I'm gonna illustrate in just a minute, I think you'll find this very interesting, is that categorization is actually doing battle with type codes. And I suppose I'll get back on my, uh, my soapbox and rant a little bit about type codes because they are killers for good data design and by that I mean ones that fully facilitate precise business communication. Um, and then the third concept is verb concepts for the third notion and that really comes down to fighting ambiguity in depth. We don't realize how ambiguous many of the things we say are. I'm probably for in, in many of your minds being ambiguous right now uh, and in order to clarify that we would need to spend time for me to use all the right verbs that are well defined in addition to the nouns and other modifiers to clarify the uh, subject area we're talking about, which in this case is how to represent knowledge. So in any case, we've already been talking about that first notion, classifications, most basic of all, and uh, it's all, it's about being very clear what we talk about so we can put things in the right conceptual bucket. In the rest of my presentation, I'll talk about the other two notions, categorization and verb concepts, and by the way, the book also covers those other two notions in a great deal of uh, detail. So yes, these three notions do address fundamental challenges of data design. Yes, they do that. They will help you. They're a starting point. They're a framework for that. <clears throat> But actually, they address a far broader set of challenges. <clears throat> and my deeper message to you today is those of us in the data community really need to take the blinders off because there are a lot of bigger fish that need to be fried these days. Um, ranging all the way from artificial intelligence and machine learning to just outright clear business communication, uh, not to mention uh, BI and analytics, data quality, and so on. Um, we've really got our hands full with challenges. So concept models, what is it? Well, you, you know the objective is to help you produce phantom free data designs that permit the highest degree of precision in business communication. What is a concept model? Well, here's how we define it. It's a set of business concepts as represented by standard terms and business definitions, along with the logical connections among those concepts. And those will be represented by verb phrases, wordings. Now, what's a concept? We have to be clear about that. If we're going to do a concept model, a concept is something conceived in the mind. And that might seem obvious to you, but here's the point I want to make about that is you don't have data in your mind. You might have some facts, but you don't have data. And what you have is you have concepts that help you express those facts. 
So concepts are really about things we talk about in the business because why? We're all our little isolated uh, islands of consciousness and the words that we use between each other have to communicate what's in our head accurately. So look at concept models this way. If you start with concepts in your data design, all you need to do to turn the concepts into data is mostly just add keys and formats and so on. That's not too hard. But if you start with data and then you try to turn the data back into concepts, you're going to need something akin to magic because the semantics are lost. They're gone. They evaporate very rapidly. And if that weren't true, Reverse engineering data sources, data stores, would be a breeze. But I can tell you from experience, and I'm sure many of you share the same experience, well, that's certainly not the case. Reverse engineering data stores is a nightmare, usually. Now, the, the standard behind what I'll be talking to you uh, has been the subject of development for well over a decade. Um, the, the standard is Semantics of Business Vocabulary and Business Rules, SBVR. So I didn't make up these concepts. Um, the, uh, the notions come from a well-established uh, standard um, in which um, logicians and some of the world's foremost um, software engineers and lingu linguists uh, participated. Um, and so I have to point out SPVR is a linguistic standard. There's a lot of misunderstanding in that regard. Its core ideas are based on natural language, not data design per se, and that's what makes it different and also so much better suited for today's challenges. Um, if you're interested in SPVR, I wouldn't invite you, I wouldn't suggest you go uh, read the standard. It's pretty heavy duty. Um, but there is a lot of explanation on brcommunity.com. Um, and so you can go out there to the uh, uh, SBVR Insider section and you can find some resources that can get you started. However, uh, the book that I wrote that I mentioned is probably uh, even a better source to get started there. Okay, let's move on to the second notion and that is categorization. And I'm going to approach this from a way that might surprise you, and that is doing battle with type codes. And I have a real thing about type codes. I don't like type codes. They obscure semantics. They're bad. So let's look at that issue. And uh, if I can convince you, I'll do my, my best to do so. Now take a look at this data. This is a different uh, bit of sample data. This comes from one of our clients in the railroading uh, industry, and it's about railroad asset table, uh, table. and Rosa, uh, it's a table about uh, railroad assets, and as you can see, there's stuff in there uh, about assets, asset ID on the left, but there are a lot of type codes and uh, various kinds of codes in there. Um, so, uh, by looking at that table, just give yourself a, a chance, do you have any idea what that data is really about other than just assets? No, I know a lot of you do a lot of uh, data forensics and stuff, so you can probably figure out a few things. Um, but let me try to give you a little bit of help by sorting through some of the type codes, and we'll just see how far that gets us. An asset can only be one of these three things. It can be a detector, which is a thing that detects trains passing by on rails and looks at speed and heat and wheel rotation and all those sort of things. Uh, fixed assets, those are things that don't move like railroad tracks and stations and uh, signs and things like that, signals. And then there are uh, stock. And those are the things that do move across the railroad tracks, like railroad cars and engines and so on. So, okay, so that helps a little. Now, kind of stock, that type code, applies only to movable assets. And that's something you need to know in order to use this data correctly. And kind of rolling stock applies only to stock uh, to, that, that are not maintenance of way, 
which is a special kind of car that helps fix tracks, or non-rolling stock, uh, sort of like end of train devices and so on. Uh, and then there is also a kind of car code, and that applies only to kinds of rolling stocks that are not locomotive or caboose or steel wheel set. Okay, now how are you feeling about this data now? You're really getting some insights into it? Are you feeling better about it? No? Well, I could go on and on and on. I haven't even, I haven't even talked about these other type codes uh, that the arrows point to. But wouldn't you agree this is just about hopeless? And in particular, which is the thing that we focus on the most, is how can you have any effective business conversation about these business things with business people. This uh, table is full of classic IT speak. It's not the language of the business at all. We just fool ourselves into thinking that it might be. Yet this is roughly how we implement data designs all the time. And, and no wonder we have a tough time coping with them. Uh, can you feel my pain here? And wouldn't it be great to have an approach that deals with such matters adequately? Well, fortunately, we do. And it's all about categorization. And so I think you're going to like this version much better than the previous slide. And this slide features deep categorization to engineer all the concepts clearly. Now, this is speaking the language of the business because the terms, the nouns at least, that they use in order to speak about the rich knowledge of railroading, and by the way, it's extremely complex, far more so than I ever imagined. Um, you know, it's, it's exactly what you need to speak uh, uh, precisely about the things of the business. So what's a category? <clears throat> Well, those heavy dark lines indicate categories. It's, spe it's specifically a special kind or variety of a broader concept. And that's very natural. It's very easy. Business people really don't have uh, much of a problem with that. But just to illustrate what I mean, let's take boxcar as an example. And we'll just walk up the hierarchy here. A boxcar going up one level is a freight car. You can see that a boxcar is just a special kind of freight car. A freight car going up another level is a special kind of car. A car is a special kind of rolling stock, just moving upward. A rolling stock is an equipment, also called a movable asset. And then finally, at the very top of the, uh, the diagram, the most general concept, which essentially covers everything in this uh, diagram is asset and asset uh, anything an instance of any box in this table would be considered an asset that's the most general conceptual bucket now by the way those of you familiar with uh, UML or object-oriented models I just want to make one clarification which I think uh, you'll find useful and helpful certainly natural for business people uh, real world instances, if you go out and look on the local train tracks and look at some cars, those cars can be in as many classes as they merit. They're not stuck in just one of these boxes. For example, a given box car is naturally all of a freight car, a car, a rolling stock, equipment, and an asset. Instances are not unnaturally forced into the lowest level nodes. That's silly. Uh, and why is that? Well, it's because we're talking about business concepts. We are not talking about software constructs. Big difference. Now, by the way, this categorization structure is from a real life concept model. Uh, we created with a railroad client of ours, as I mentioned, and this particular neighborhood is what we call this subset of the overall model. You can't get all of the, of the whole model on one screen or one piece of paper. It's perhaps one of 25 neighborhoods in their complete model, so fairly extensive, not the largest we've ever done, but fairly extensive. Um, rich categorization is not very natural or common in traditional structured design. 
You do see it frequently, of course, in ontologies and graph databases, and that's all great and fine. But, you know, those in general are serving yet other purposes, often programming purposes, as opposed to communication with business people. So what makes the concept models distinct? As before, definitions reign supreme in concept models. This diagram just provides a convenient picture or illustration. Uh, so the categorization illustration, the diagram, and the definitions must align. But actually, that makes the definitions much easier and much richer, as, as some examples I have for you at the bottom left illustrate. And let's go through the examples very quickly just to illustrate. And notice as I do how important that first word in each definition is in sort of locking in the concept with respect to the larger set of concepts that we have. So what's the maintenance of way? Again, it's it's just a it's a special kind of car that's not for transport, it's for fixing tracks and so on, uh, installing tracks. So what is it? It's a rolling stock. And notice that's the next higher category. It is a rolling stock used to support the mail the maintenance of the railroad. And that's what makes it different and distinct. The next higher category is rolling stock. What's that? Again, the first word gives you a big hint. It's a movable asset or an equipment that has rail wheels. Not all equipment actually has rail wheels, such as in the train device and intermodal units and so on. Uh, and then an equipment or uh, movable asset, well, that's an asset. Notice that's the top word in the diagram. That's the most general concept. It is an asset that's expected to move in the right of way and support a railroad operations, unlike fixed assets, which you see on the left, which don't, and detectors, which don't either. So as I mentioned before, the first word in definition to fit this together in a cohesive illustration of the concepts is extremely important. That's a categorization scheme, fairly, uh, fairly deep, but representative of real world practice. So here's another difference between concept models and data models. A concept model forces you to see type codes for what they really are. They're pure, they're pure data constructs. They are pure IT speak. We don't want them. We don't need them. Uh, they're not useful for business communication. So why do we have them in data designs? Well, you could argue that a big part of the reason is just pure legacy. It's an artifact back from the day when disk space was scarce and expensive. But I would su submit to you, and cloud is an evidence uh, here, that disk space is not as scarce and expensive as it once was. Whatever the case, in today's world, Clear communication is about, about business knowledge is far more important than compact data schemes using type codes. Now, the categorizations are exactly the right, give you exactly the right nouns you need to express business thoughts precisely. And here's an example. I have a three level categorization on the bottom, the most narrow concept, limited liability corporation, which is a special case or type or kind category of corporation, which in turn going upward is a special case or category always of organization. And I have an, an additional thing I threw in to sort of make it interesting. There's a little verb phrase here, has been dissolved. That's called a unary verb concept. Um, and it's either true or false. That's um, part of uh, concept modeling, the unary verb concepts. They're either true or false. They're Boolean. They help you express, make statements like business rules. Um, uh, I'll get to verb concepts in a minute, but let me just let me just show you something about this model because what I have is the right terminology to expect to express the right business rule correctly and sensibly and precisely. So here we have the business rule: a limited liability corporation must be dissolved if a member leaves. 
and in fact, in most uh, states in the in the U.S., that's the law. That's just the what the rule is. Now, you would not say this wouldn't be correct. It wouldn't be precise. A corporation must be dissolved if a member leaves. No, a corporation doesn't dissolve. Doesn't need to dissolve if a member leaves. And the third alternative would certainly not be correct. A uh, corporation, um, or rather a um, organization must be dissolved if a member leaves. No, organizations don't need to dissolve if, if just a, some particular member leaves. So the categorization, as you can see, gives you exactly the term you need to be precise um, uh, with expressing your business rules. And by the way, as you can see, and, and this is going to get us into our third topic, has been dissolved, that verb phrase is used in each of those business rules to give you the precision and consistency of expression that you need. So now let's do turn to the third uh, major notion of concept models, and that's verb concepts. And the way that normal communication takes place, in fact, the way we're communicating right now is through complete sentences. I hope most of what I say are complete sentences that follow grammatical conventions. That's how you communicate about rich knowledge. And we are talking about a body of knowledge here when it comes to concept modeling and data design and so on. And those in, uh, conventions inevitably include verb concepts. You can't create sentences without verb concepts. So the fundamental problem with structured data a fundamental problem is that it's essentially been stripped bare of almost all grammatical conventions. And what problems can that cause? Well, here's just a simple example. You see this data, it's quite simple. It's about orders. It's about as simple as you can imagine. But let's try to reconstruct the meaning from just what you see here in the table. Now, I, as I like to do, I tried to express the semantics of the data by writing out a sentence um, that indicates the meaning uh, that apparently underlies the data, or what I would guess anyway does. The order with ID 20680 was placed by C, and then I get pretty much stuck with my sentence right there. Who, who does what? with respect to the city of Utrecht. So I got stuck right off. How can I be sure the true connection between this person C and the order 20680? You know, what, what is the true connection? I'm just guessing. I mean, it could be lives in. Yes, that's true. But it also could be place the order in. It could also be wants the order shipped to. It, it could be a lot of things. The semantics are gone. They're lost. This is not good for communication. Actually, the situation is even worse than what I describe. We already made an assumption by saying was placed by. I did anyway. I just assumed that that's what that connection was about. But how can we be sure? Uh, C could be the recipient of order 20680. You know, so easy to make mistakes. So what we're forcing users, business people to do is to make a lot of assumptions about the data and the underlying structures. And, frank, and, and, and quite frankly, they're simply often going to be wrong. Why do we let business users and developers chase phantoms around like that all the time? So here's what I call the ironclad rule of ambiguity. If something can be misinterpreted, it will be misinterpreted. You know, because this is IT speak. And it's killing the data's ability to speak the language of the business. So wouldn't it be nice if we could set ourselves free from having to make sub such assumptions and also requiring users of the data to make such assumptions. <clears throat> so let's look beyond just pure data design for a minute. You know, like I said, you know, data 
people in particular, there there are much bigger fish to be frying these days than just straightforward data design. Um, you know, data is central to all sorts of areas of of the business, including, including but not limited to communication. So here's an example to illustrate clarity of communication, precision of expression. Now this example happens to be a business rule, which happens to be one of our specialties, but the, the, the same points I'll make about it hold true for any kind of business communication, including but not limited to textual requirements and writing other kinds of documents, such as help documents, such as policy documents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of kinds of business communications that businesses need to write. So here's what it says. <clears throat> Read it with me. An order must not be shipped if the outstanding balance exceeds credit authorization. Okay, let that uh, sink into your brain just a second. On first reading, probably the sentence might seem clear enough. But I guarantee you, as you look closer and closer, the meaning will become quite murky. There's something that seems to be missing or hidden from view. So you need to start asking questions, which is what you know good data analysts do anyway. The outstanding balance of what? What are we talking about? Are we talking about order, customer, account, shipment? The credit authorization of what? Are we talking about order, customer, account, shipment? What are we talking about? And that those hidden semantics, the hidden meaning is what's going to uh, derail us from speaking precisely. <clears throat> so to disambiguate the sentence, you need verbs. You need verb concepts so that you can complete the sentences properly and eliminate misunderstanding. So let's suppose that we have the following wordings for the relevant verb concepts available from our concept model. They've been included there. We have illustrations of them. I don't have an illustration here, uh, but we could. So we have these wordings between our noun concepts. Outstanding balance is of account. Account is held by customer. Customer places order. Credit authorization is of customer. Let's assume those are correct. Let's assume that that's the common parlance. So what we can do, and then I want you to recognize that in the process, we're eliminating ambiguity. We're squeezing out the ambiguity, is we can insert those wordings for the verb concepts into the original sentence and by doing so, we will make it far more precise. That's the secret. That's the secret sauce of achieving precision in business communication. So when you work these wordings into the original sentence, as I've done on the right here, here's what you get. An order must not be shipped if the outstanding balance of the account held by the customer, aha, that's what outstanding balance we're talking about. Um, that place the order, that's the customer, exceeds the credit authorization of that customer. Ah, it's just not any uh, credit authorization. It's of that particular customer. So now, I'm not saying we're 100% done. I'm not sure somebody couldn't find some ambiguity, but we're far better um, at uh, communication and making sure that we've got things on the right playing field uh, for precision and communication. So the sentence, the new sentence, the revived sentence, inserting the verbs back, which we have to do when we communicate like this anyway, it now makes deep sense. And it's certainly sufficient for formal communication. And perhaps I would argue even for computation. But that's a bit uh, beyond today's uh, discussion, so I won't go there. So here then is another major difference between concept models and data models. Uh, to disambiguate what we say about the world, our focus needs to be on both nouns and verbs in equal measure. And data models have simply never treated verbs as equal citizens. We need something else. We need something that's focused on business communication and on concepts. 
not on representing data, especially given that that data is not in our heads. If you're depending on entities and relationships and attributes to get you where you need to go in the knowledge age, you're going to fall way short. Um, so are data objects and class diagrams. I'm sorry, that's just old school. It's 20th century, it's not 21st century. And frankly, the old schools of data modeling are just not up to the challenges of the digital age. I hope we can all agree that some far better techniques are needed or at least should be entertained. So perhaps the biggest difference of all between concept models and data models is that in concept models, treat verb concepts, treat verbs as first class citizens. Why? It's impossible to communicate without a complete sentence, which is to say a complete thought without verbs. Try it, it's just not possible. So here's what I would say. Increasingly, the job uh, professionals, including and especially data professionals, is not just to build database and develop software solutions, but rather to achieve clarity in business communication. If we don't do it, who will? And don't you want to communicate better? I, I certainly do. I worked at it all my life, still working at it. It's a lifelong uh, goal and journey. So I say take the data blinders off, step up to the challenge, concept models give you the necessary tools. Now everything we've discussed today and a whole lot more is covered in my new book on concept models, so I do hope you'll take a look. I've, I've told, I've been told it's a uh, fairly easy reading, fairly well written, which is, you know, the ultimate compliment in my book. Uh, concept models truly enable you and your data to speak the language of the business. So what have I told you today? If you find yourself talking about data as if it's reality, you're literally not in the real world. Data isn't reality. What matters is your conceptualization of reality. In other words, those concepts that you hold in your mind and defining them and getting them out on the table and then using the vocabulary precisely in communicating between our little islands of consciousness, uh, individual people uh, in the business. So concept models feature three basic notions as I've described that to help you with that conceptualization. Classification, which is about putting things in the right conceptual buckets. Categorization, doing battles with type codes and verb concepts, which is all about fighting ambiguity. The deliverable is a concept model. Concept modeling not only gives you world-class skills for data design, but the far richer techniques you need to succeed in a digital world for the knowledge economy. Okay, well, that's what I have to say. I, I think we have a few minutes for questions, and so I hope so. Um, please contact me or connect with me on social media. Uh, Google my new book. Have a look at it on Amazon. And thank you very much for sharing this time uh, together with me today. I hope it's been valuable for you.